hurry up, please? I am, I'm hurrying. Traffic is very heavy. crash. People with injuries requiring immediate care. We've all wondered how we would respond to an emergency like this one. Injuries are one of the most significant health problems in our nation today. So common, in fact, that statistics indicate most of us will have a severe injury at some time in our lives. Knowing what causes injuries and what the main types of injuries are may help you care for an injury should it happen. Motor vehicle crashes are the leading cause of injury-related deaths. And motor vehicle crashes cost the most money. But no matter what the cause, when you're called upon to care for an injury, follow your emergency action steps. Check. Call. Care. Check the scene for safety. When you are sure the scene is safe, then check the victim. If you are certain there are no life-threatening emergencies, check head to toe for less serious problems. Uh, call an ambulance. That's 911. Tell them we have a car accident. Call 911 or your emergency number for an ambulance. And then give care for what you find until more advanced help arrives. Because the care you give depends on what you find, it's important to know what clues of injuries to look for when you check the victim. There are two main types of injuries. Injuries to the skin and soft tissues, such as wounds or burns, and injuries to muscles, bones, and joints. Some wounds break the skin. They are easy to recognize because bleeding is visible. When a wound is open, germs can get in through the break in the skin and cause infection. Other wounds are not as obvious. An injury such as one caused by a fall from a height can cause bleeding under the skin where it is not visible. These closed wounds can be serious. What happened? He fell. So don't move. Lie still. Go to the sleeping bags. And my coat. So don't move. Lie still. When the cause of an injury is severe, you should suspect internal bleeding and check for these clues. Tender, swollen, bruised, or hard areas of the body, such as the abdomen. Skin that feels cool or moist or looks pale or bluish. Vomiting or coughing up blood. Excessive thirst. Becoming confused, faint, drowsy, or unconscious. Caring for open wounds includes controlling bleeding and preventing infection. Remember that most bleeding will usually stop by itself after a few minutes. For major wounds with severe bleeding, you must control the bleeding immediately. It's also important to clean and cover minor wounds to prevent infection. If you suspect serious internal bleeding, call for an ambulance immediately. But if the person has a minor closed wound, like a bruise, applying cold will help control the pain and bleeding. With glamorous merchandise, fabulous and exciting bonus prizes, including this. Experience the sport of starvation. Yeah, it's right out here. Ah! <laughs> a burn is a special type of soft tissue injury caused by exposure to heat, chemicals, or electricity. Check the scene for safety, since burns caused by chemicals or electricity can be a danger to you. Burns by heat are the most common. There are three types of burns. Burns that may only affect the surface layers of the skin. Burns that are more severe, that form blisters and affect deeper layers of the skin. And the most severe burns, which can affect the skin and soft tissue down to the bone. You do? I bet they're pretty. I yeah. do too. You do? <laughs> oh, wait. 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 Oh,
right here. I'll be right back. To care for a burn, follow these general steps. First, stop the burning. Then cool the burn with large amounts of cool water. And then cover it with dry, clean dressings to help prevent infection. You must call for an ambulance if the victim is a child or elderly person, or if the victim has difficulty breathing, has burns that cover more than one body part, has burns to the head, neck, hands, feet, or genitals, or has burns from chemicals, explosions, or electricity. If the burn is caused by chemicals, flush the burned area with cool running water to stop the burning and cool the burn. If the burn is electrical, check for life-threatening conditions. If there are none, cover the burn and care for the victim until the ambulance arrives. A second type of injury is an injury to a muscle, bone, or joint. Muscles can be strained. Bones can be broken. And joints can be sprained or dislocated. Most muscle, bone, or joint injuries are painful, but may or may not be serious. Can you walk? I don't think so. Always suspect a serious muscle, bone, or joint injury when the following signals or clues are present. The person cannot use the affected part normally. There are visible bone fragments or the feeling of a snap, pop, or bones grating. There is significant bruising, swelling, or other deformity. Some of these clues are not always easy to recognize. Sometimes comparing the same part on the other side of the body will help. For injuries to a muscle, bone, or joint, the best care you can give is rest, ice, and elevation. If you suspect a serious injury to a muscle, bone, or joint, keep the injured part from moving. The ground can be used to immobilize an injured part. If you have to move the victim, first splint the injury. Do not elevate a severe injury unless it has been splinted. In any serious injury, a condition called shock is likely to develop. Shock happens when the circulatory system fails to deliver blood to all parts of the body. Shock is a life-threatening condition. See about Sam. I didn't see him. How are you feeling, sir? Did you hit your head? Are you hurt anywhere? My, my hand. I better go see if they're all right. No, no just it'd be best if you stayed still. Someone's helping them. But, but I think Try I... not to move. Always watch for the following signals or clues of shock when caring for any victim. Restlessness or irritability. Changes in consciousness. Pale, cool, moist skin. Rapid breathing. Rapid pulse. By caring for the specific injury, you will be doing all you can to minimize shock. To review, whether at work or at home, injuries are likely to happen. If an injury does occur, follow your three emergency action steps. Check, call, care. Check the scene for safety and the victim for signals of injury. Call 911 or your emergency number for an ambulance if you find signals of serious injury and care for conditions you find. And remember, whenever you give care, comfort and reassure the victim. Keep the person from getting chilled or overheated and watch for any changes in the person's condition. When an injury occurs, knowing how to respond enables you to give the best care possible until an ambulance arrives. If you find that a person is bleeding severely, 
you must take steps to control the bleeding. Follow these steps. Cover the wound and press firmly. Elevate and bandage. If bleeding does not stop, squeeze the artery against the bone. Most bleeding will stop on its own within a few minutes, but severe bleeding must be controlled immediately. To begin, cover the wound with a sterile dressing or clean cloth and press firmly against the wound. Okay. Could you hold this for me? Then, elevate the body part, in this case, the leg. If possible, raise the wound above the level of the heart to help slow bleeding. Next, use a roller bandage to bandage the wound. Cover the dressing completely using overlapping turns. Secure the bandage by taping or tying off the end. If blood soaks through the bandage, place additional dressings on top of the first dressing and wrap with another bandage. If bleeding still does not stop, find the appropriate artery and squeeze the artery against the bone. Major arteries carry blood from the heart to all parts of the body. Two of these arteries are the brachial arteries in the arms and the femoral arteries in the legs. Squeezing an artery against a bone will slow the flow of blood beyond that point. The point where you press on the artery is called a pressure point. There are four pressure points that are commonly used to help control bleeding. The pressure points for the arms are on the inside of the upper arm, midway between the shoulder and the elbow. For the legs, the pressure points are at the front of the leg where the hip bends. Watch again as this rescuer finds the femoral artery at the bend in the hip and uses the heel of her hand to squeeze the artery against the bone. Keep the leg elevated and maintain direct pressure on the wound and on the pressure point until medical help arrives. Following these steps will help to prevent infection and minimize shock. If the wound is on the victim's arm, steps for controlling bleeding are the same. Cover the wound and press firmly, elevate, and bandage. If bleeding does not stop, add additional dressings and bandage. If bleeding still doesn't stop, squeeze the artery against the bone. In this case, use the brachial artery on the inside of the upper arm. Press firmly with your fingers, squeezing the artery against the underlying bone. If a wound includes an object which is impaled in the body, do not remove the object. The object itself may be helping to stop the flow of blood. Removing the object may cause more damage and bleeding. Try to keep both the object and the body parts still to avoid further injury. Place dressings around the object. Press lightly against the wound. 
Place several bulky dressings around the object to keep it from moving. Apply a roller bandage over the dressings and around the object. Use overlapping turns until the dressings and object are secured in place. In review, to control external bleeding, follow these steps. Cover the wound and press firmly. Elevate and bandage. If bleeding does not stop, apply additional dressings and bandage. If bleeding still does not stop, squeeze the artery against the bone. Remember, controlling severe bleeding helps prevent infection and minimize shock. If the wound has an impaled object, follow the same steps and use bulky dressings to hold the object in place. Bandage around the object. When you suspect that a person has an injury to a muscle, bone, or joint, you may have to splint the injury. Splinting is a technique used to keep the injured body part from moving. A splint can be anatomic, soft, or rigid. An anatomic splint uses another part of the victim's body to immobilize an injured area. For instance, a leg can be splinted to a leg a finger to a finger, or an arm to the chest. A soft splint can be a folded blanket or towel or a pillow. Soft splints can be easily shaped to fit around an injured area. A triangular bandage when tied as a sling is another kind of soft splint used to support the arm. A rigid splint can be a board, magazine, cardboard, or newspaper. Any of these methods can be used to minimize movement. The method you choose will depend on the materials available and the location of the injury. Try to splint an injury in the position you find it. A splint should include the areas above and below the site of the injury. For example, if the injury is to a joint, immobilize the bones above and below the joint. If the injury is to a bone, immobilize the joints above and below that bone. No matter what splinting method you choose, always follow these steps. Support the injured area. Check for feeling, warmth, and color. Place the splint. Tie the splint in place. And recheck feeling, warmth, and color. An anatomic splint uses the victim's body to splint the injured area. When using an anatomic splint on the leg, support the injured area above and below the site of the injury. If the injured leg is against the ground, the ground is supporting the injured area. Check for feeling, warmth, and color. Find out if the person has feeling in her toes and if the skin is warm or cool. To place the splint, thread several folded triangular bandages under the injured leg. Guide each triangular bandage through the gap under either the knee or ankle and slide it into position. 
This will help minimize movement of the injured leg. Place the folded triangular bandages above and below the site of the injury. Then, move the healthy leg next to the injured leg. Tie the splint in place by tying the ends of each bandage together. Do not tie any of them directly over the injured area. Finally, make sure the splint is not too tight. Recheck for feeling, warmth, and color. How does that feel? If the person has lost feeling in her toes, or if her skin has become cool or pale, loosen the splint a little. Other parts of the body can also be used as anatomic splints. For instance, an injured finger can be splinted to another finger. or an injured arm can be splinted to the chest. Binding the arm to the chest is also an effective way of immobilizing injuries to the shoulder, ribs, or chest. A soft splint, such as a folded blanket, can be used to splint an injured ankle. To begin, support the injured area, Check for feeling, warmth, and color below the injury. Can you feel that? If the victim is wearing a shoe, you will only be able to check for feeling. To place the splint, thread several folded triangular bandages above and below the injured area. Guide them through the space under the knee or ankle and slide them into position. Place two above the ankle and one at the heel. Gently wrap the folded blanket around the injured area. Because it is soft, it will mold itself around the injury. Tie the splint in place so that the foot and ankle don't move. Finally, Recheck for feeling, warmth, and color to make sure the splint is not too tight. Can you feel that? Soft splints can also be used on other parts of the body. This towel is immobilizing an injured forearm. An injured hand can be immobilized by placing a roll of gauze into the palm and then carefully wrapping the whole fist with a roller bandage. A sling is a special kind of soft splint used for immobilizing an injured arm or shoulder. To begin, support the injured area. If possible, have the victim help you. Feel the fingers to check for feeling, warmth, and color. To place the sling, thread one end of a triangular bandage under the injured arm and over the uninjured shoulder. Position the point of the triangular bandage at the elbow. Bring the other end across the chest and over the opposite shoulder. Tie the ends of the sling at the side of the neck. Next, use a folded triangular bandage to bind the sling to the chest. This binder prevents movement of the arm. Finally, recheck the fingers for feeling, warmth, and color to make sure the splint is not too tight. How does that feel? It's secure. 
A rigid splint, such as a padded board, can be used to immobilize an injured forearm. To begin, support the injured area. If possible, have the victim help you. Check feeling, warmth, and color at a site below the injury. In this case, check the hand and fingers. Next, place the splint so that it supports the areas above and below the injury. Padding the palm keeps the hand in a natural position. Next, tie the splint in place. Place the bandages above and below the site of the injury. Then, recheck feeling, warmth, and color to be sure the bandages are not too tight. This splint has immobilized the joint below the injury, the wrist. But the joint above the injury, the elbow, can still move. To prevent movement of the elbow, you can use a sling and a binder. Again, recheck feeling, warmth, and color to make sure the splint is not too tight. Rigid splints can also be used to immobilize other parts of the body, like an injured leg or an injured finger. To review, anatomic splints, soft splints, slings, and rigid splints are all effective ways to immobilize an injury to a muscle, bone, or joint. Try to splint the injury in the position you find it. Splint above and below the injured area. Follow these basic steps. Support the injured area. Check for feeling, warmth, and color. Place the splint. Tie the splint in place. And recheck feeling, warmth, and color. someone becomes suddenly ill, it can be hard to tell what is wrong. Sometimes you won't notice obvious signals or clues. Often the clues are confusing, making it difficult to determine if the victim's condition is an emergency requiring an ambulance. In some instances you may know what is wrong. For example, you may know the person is diabetic or has a history of heart problems or stroke or you may see signs that indicate poisoning or you know the person has been exposed to extremes of either hot or cold. Unfortunately, more often than not, you won't know what has caused a person to become suddenly ill. But by the end of the course, you will know what to do. Follow your emergency action steps. Check, call, care. First, check the scene and the victim. Look around the environment.
Try and figure out what the victim was doing. Take in the whole picture. Do you need anything else? Then check no. the victim. Look, maybe I just need to lie down. For when Can a person I... becomes suddenly yes. ill, he or she often looks and feels ill. The person may be able to tell you what is wrong. Learn to recognize these signals or clues of sudden illness. Feeling lightheaded, dizzy, confused, or weak. Changes in skin color with pale or flushed skin or sweating. Nausea or vomiting. Diarrhea. Some sudden illnesses may also include changes in consciousness, seizure, paralysis or inability to move, slurred speech, difficulty seeing, severe headache, breathing difficulty, persistent pressure or pain. Sometimes these signals may come and go, making it difficult to know whether to call for Maybe an ambulance. Call oh, don't be silly. Something's wrong. Greg, watch your father. Since calling for an ambulance is often the most important action you can take to help the victim, Hello. it's critical that you call. If the victim is unconscious, unusually confused, or seems to be losing consciousness, has trouble breathing, or is breathing in a strange way, has persistent chest pain or pressure, has pressure or pain in the abdomen that does not go away, is vomiting or passing blood, has seizures, severe headaches, or slurred speech, appears to have been poisoned. Mr. Smith? Mr. Smith, are you all right? I don't feel well. You don't look so well. Well, you look a little pale. Care well, for sudden illness by following these general rest. guidelines. Do your time, oh, maybe? Good idea. Help the victim rest comfortably. Okay, can I get you anything? Uh, I'm cold. Okay. Keep the victim from it's getting cold. chilled or overheated. Okay. Reassure the victim. Keep you warm a little bit. Watch for changes in consciousness yeah. and breathing. Water, maybe. Give food or liquid yeah. only if the victim is fully conscious. Maybe if you, um... Just took a few minutes and relax. Ask if the victim has any medical okay, conditions or is taking any medication. That's much better. Thanks. Yeah, all right. Hi, Doris. Oh, hi, Anne. Take a look at this picture of my niece. Isn't she cute? Oh, look at her. She is cute. Yeah. This is an adorable picture. I like that oh. outfit. I'm feeling dizzy. What's the matter? In certain situations, Anne, you may know what has caused the person to become ill. Anne, Anne, situations okay? like these may Anne, require specific okay? care. Anne, Anne, are you okay? Oh, did I faint? Yeah, you did. But you lie still for a moment. I'm going to get something to put under your feet. If you suspect the person has fainted, position them on the back and elevate the feet 8 to 10 inches. If the person feels sick to their stomach or vomits, okay. roll him or her to the side to keep the airway clear. Thank you. If the person is having a diabetic emergency, give the person some form of sugar. Okay, Paul. I want you to take small sips real easy now. Easy now. Just relax. That's it. Michael! Michael! What's wrong? Can you hear me? If the person is having a seizure, cushion the victim's head using folded clothing or a towel to make a small pillow. Do not hold or restrain the person or place anything between the victim's teeth. Remove any nearby objects that might cause injury. Remember, as with injuries, the condition called shock is likely to develop with any sudden illness. By giving the appropriate care, you will be doing all you can to minimize shock. Slay back, I'll do it. Not knowing the underlying cause of a sudden illness should not prevent you from responding to the emergency. 
because in any sudden illness, you can always do something to help by following your three emergency action steps. Check, call, care. Check the scene, then check the victim. Call 911 or your local emergency number for an ambulance. And then give care for what you find. And remember, knowing the signals of sudden illness and how to respond to them enables you to give care with confidence until the ambulance arrives.